three, two, one. Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 134. Mondays we reserve for the really hard hitting topics. The topics that people, the theologians sit down and watch us and say, gosh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's October 27th, 2004. Okay, it's Meaty Monday. By that, George and I take on really hard topics, uh, theological concepts, or just church news uh, that we hope you'll uh, find interesting, entertaining, and informative. Um, there's some breaking news that George and I will talk about in a minute, but before we can talk about that, we want to frame uh, the news uh, in a historical perspective. For those of you who are in the know, you understand that the Church of England was formed many, uh, hundred, many, a couple hundred years ago, uh, when a certain king, Henry VIII, wanted an annulment uh, of his marriage from his wife. Kevin, do you remember the old uh, children's rhyme? Uh, divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. <laughs> yes, the rhyme of how to remember who made it and who didn't with Ken, uh, King Henry VIII. Um, at a certain point, the Pope said, we're not going to uh, allow you to have an annulment. You, you're, you're making a farce of the situation. Uh, you can forget it. And this brought about uh, the ability for uh, people within England to step forward and say, there's another way. And that other way was the Church of England, and uh, such was the formation of the Church of England. So divorce, annulment, uh, clergy, bishops are real big in our history. It's, you know, it was a catalyst for our formation, George. Yeah, the, the common, uh, common conception is that the Church of England was founded because Henry VIII wanted a divorce. No. Henry VIII actually opposed divorce. Mm -hmm. He would not allow it to become legal in the Church of England. It was uh, something introduced by the Continental Reformers, and Henry VIII said no. He did believe in annulments, and he had four annulments. True, two of the wives he had annulments with, he later had their heads chopped off after a few days after the ink was dry. <clears throat> but in, even running up to uh, Edward VIII in the 1930s, uh, when the king wanted, when the uncrowned king wanted to marry a divorced woman, Wallace Warfield Simpson, the Church of England would not allow it to happen. The Church of England taught the indissolubility of marriage. Marriage was once and forever, and you could not get divorced and remarried in church. Now, in the modern era, when they introduced civil divorce, the, that was fine, but you could not, until 2002, get married a second time in the Church of England if you had a living spouse, unless there were exceptional circumstances. Well, And so... Well, the, one of the, the interesting things, if, if I remember correctly, couldn't you get a divorce in Parliament? You, well, yes, actually, there is a higher power than Jesus saying, I hate divorce, which is Parliament. And between, I believe, 1607 and uh, 1821, they granted 300 divorces and told the Church of England those people who had been divorced should be allowed to be remarried under the Church of England. And the Church of England said, okay. <laughs> so... If, if the Church of England ever decides to bless gay marriages, there's a precedent <laughs> for being told what to do by the state. So, but, but the point is, marriage has been one of the things that the Church of England has been very, very strong about, and as well as the Episcopal Church. Divorce and remarriage wasn't possible in the Episcopal Church until the 1940s, uh, at, the very er at the very earliest. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much a question of the pastoral issue. The church has always allowed people who've been divorced and remarried to receive Holy Communion. We've not excluded people from the church life because of their marital status. But you just couldn't have your second, you couldn't have subsequent marriages blessed by the church if you had a living ex-spouse. Now, now we move to today. Yeah, we move to today. First of all, you know, George and I are not making light of divorce. Uh, we have friends who have been divorced, um, uh, and we understand the pain involved in the family, the children, uh, society, because of divorce. We're not making light of that. What we want to do here is draw the uh, uh, genesis of the Church of England 
um, their fight for marriage over the years to today's news. And I just want to get that out of the way. We're not sitting here being all smiley about divorce. Divorce is horrid. It's horrible. Um, there's a reason Jesus uh, uh, could not find reason for it. and But we want to move on to today because breaking news, we got a, a letter passed to us by uh, Bishop Baker saying, ah, guess what? I'm going to be sending out wedding invitations soon, and I thought you guys should all know. Um, tell me about this letter, George. October 22nd, hmm. Bishop Jonathan Baker, the Bishop of Fulham, wrote to his clergy announcing that he was going to get married. Next spring, there would be a civil service followed by a blessing performed at a church, and uh, the Bishop of London would be the celebrant. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Episcopal Church, that wouldn't really be such a big deal. However, Bishop Baker is the flying bishop, the traditionalist bishop set apart by the Church of England to serve traditionalists in London and the Southeast. He's the guy, if you will not accept the ordination of women if you refuse to allow second marriages for divorcees in your church this was the bishop you were given for theological affinity this is the original is, this is the original depot the original alternative episcopal oversight um early in the this, uh, it was in the 80s or 90s that they started to uh, uh, nine, go, uh go all soft and so Not, well in, in nine in the 90s they started having the flying bishops right now, Bishop Baker is also the chairman of Fordham Faith. And until 2010, the Church of England just would not allow a divorced man to become a bishop. Mm -hmm. There had only been three previous divorced, remarried bishops in the history of the Church of England, two under Elizabeth I and one in 2006. Mm -hmm. Now, the Church the, and the Fordham Faith made a big stink about this issue, and they said divorce and remarriage is of more fundamental theological importance than the homosexuality issue. Let's just put the gay stuff aside for one second and say we really have to hold the line here, that marriage is indissoluble. Yes, we need to have pastoral sensitivity and love and awareness and not drive people away from the church when their marriages fail, but we cannot allow for second church marriages because it goes clean against scripture. This was Ford and Faith's argument. 2010, the rules were changed. Who was the first bishop to be divorced and remarried? <laughs> well, it's soon to be a, a Bishop Baker. Uh, now, what? sure, it's interesting by who he is and stuff like that, but also interesting is some of the responses we're seeing to the story on Facebook and on Anglican Inc. Um, oh, we're, so, we're getting hate mail. Yeah. We're getting uh, love mail. Yes. We've, had, we've, had, we've had emails from uh, very notable bishops saying, Right on, thank you for mentioning this. We've had others, uh, emails demanding uh, that we uh, tone down our story because it is hurtful to them. But if we move past the individual, for my mind, why this story is important, why Americans should even care about this, is that one of the things we saw over the last year, one of the things that Bob Duncan did away with and Foley Beach is not going to do, is allow affinity diocese mm -hmm. where you pick your bishop because your bishop believes and thinks the way you do ford and faith bishops flying bishops in the church of england were the foundation stone for this affinity concept mm -hmm. that you could get somebody just like you and the problem with that is that people change and the acna for instance is moving towards having bishops overseeing people who are anglo-catholic evangelical charismatic the whole gamut under one bishop by geography because that was the traditional way of doing it because if you do it by based upon the person you're setting yourself up for a fall if that person proves not to be the person you want yeah i think that now we see this falling we now see this falling apart in england because the flying bishops traditionalists are going to need a flying bishop for their flying bishop you know, just in case people don't know, affinity still exists in the uh, Church of North America, but they have uh, decided not to continue that practice. Yes, uh, so at some point over the next uh, couple generations, you'll see those uh, dioceses dissolve and move into a geographical uh, diocese, uh, which is more desirable. Because I think there's an instant folly in um, affinity. There's an instant folly in uh, having to be able to choose your bishop. Um, 
And if you go way back to the parish model of uh, the 1600s and the 1700s, you couldn't you know, choose your parish priest. Kevin, the rule is play the ball, not the man. Yeah, that's right. If you play the man in church politics, if the man falls short, your whole structure falls apart, your ecclesiology falls apart. Mm -hmm. If you play the ball um, and you know follow the game and look at what is important, which is Jesus Christ, then you can withstand the vicissitudes of good bishops, bad bishops. Now, I come at this from the prejudice of an evangelical who thinks bishops are necessary evils, okay? So maybe this is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy on my part. But I do think it is necessary that we not get trapped into trying to recreate churches and bishops and structures in our own image, but allow God to be God. Absolutely. Now, we'll have to follow the story closely over the next couple of weeks and months and see what happens. Um, I'm expecting a lot more outcry, and it's going to be interesting, the relationship between Forward and Faith UK and Forward and Faith US over the next uh, uh, year or so, and uh, to see if that's further stressed uh, beyond breaking or not very unbreaking. Um, George, that's our Monday Madness, uh, our meaty topic. Uh, we'll see what happens on Wednesday.